still the Lord's Prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege I have to come before your people. And you know, Lord, how unworthy I am of this position and how much I need your help every time I do this. And so I ask for that now. And Lord, while we're coming to you in prayer, we also want to hold out uh, Skylar, uh, Roberta, and Kelly as they transition into kind of a new part of life where Skylar goes away to school and they have an empty house. So I pray, Lord, that you will comfort them, that you will help them to stay in contact, that you will help Skylar draw closer to you in school and not further away. And that they will draw closer together as a family. I thank you, Lord, for all the many, many blessings you've given us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We've already uh, read the <coughs> text that I picked. Um, I like Linda doing the bulletin because she called me and she said, hey, what's the scripture? I said, oh, I don't have it yet. And she called me again. I asked her to call me again. She called me again. I, I kind of need that. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a handicapped. Okay. Uh, huh? Lackadaisical. Lackadaisical. Yeah, that might work too. And so, uh, and so it was really nice to have her call me and remind me, you know. And uh, so I chose this particular text. And it was kind of in connection with my friend Keith, uh, Keith Hall that I told you about. He's, he's still guard, and, but he, had, he used to be the captain of the, I guess that's what we call him, the guard there at Jinx. And then uh, when he, when this uh, position at a college uh, came available to him, obviously he uh, went for that. So he went the third shift and kind of gave up the captain's position. Uh, but he is going to go to Tennessee and, and get to teach class. And I believe that will be Monday, will be his first class. And uh, I tell him he'll, he'll be fine because he has a good sense of humor. You know, a lot of times speaking in public, we, we're our worst critics, you know, I mean, uh, we're the ones that pick at ourselves worse than anyone, and so I said, don't worry about all that, just be yourself and enjoy it. So, I'm glad that you guys uh, with me praying for it uh, during our prayer time, I think it was fine. He is, I don't know if he's Catholic, but he is studying to be a Catholic. I'm not really sure which way. And so we've had many enjoyable conversations. Uh, but he sent me an email about uh, why they observe the first day of the week as opposed to the seventh. And reading that email, I thought, wow, okay. Uh, they made some points that to me were uh, Irrational? Is that is that not? I'm trying to say it in a kind way. I, I don't want to be because again, I, I love this guy and and I don't have anything against anyone, no matter what religion they are or, or denomination, whichever way you want to say that. But anyway, uh, things like uh, Sunday is the eighth day. I thought, well, we don't count to eight days, so that doesn't work. The math is wrong. If you had been, I think it was Wednesday night, if you had been there Wednesday night, you would have found out where that eighth day came from. Okay. Well, uh, according to them, it's the eighth day of creation that happened at the cross or something like that. Uh, and then there were some other things. And so they got me on this topic, you know, thinking about it. And so I thought, well, you know, then I was listening to, I, when I drive back and forth to work, I either listen to books on like DVD, I mean CD, not DVD, CD, or I will, um, or I will listen to Christian radio. Now, unfortunately, eh, I don't know if it's unfortunate, but there isn't Adventist radio anymore here in Arkansas, or not Central Arkansas anymore, and so I have to listen to you know just regular Christian radio. But I like talk radio. I want them to tell me something. I don't want to listen to the same songs over and over, and so I, I do listen to well. Um, one of the ladies that I really like her, the way she speaks, and 
and what she talks about. She talked about uh, the story that we're going to go over now. Um, and as she was telling the story, I saw things and I was like, ah, I never really thought about it from that angle. So, so let's look at this story. If you, if you have, oh, by the way, uh, in this text you can see, it says that they reject the commandments of God so that they can keep their tradition. So think about that as we go into this uh, story. So turn in your Bibles. Oh, see, I'm getting myself all confused. So speaking of tradition, if anybody knows what this picture is from, then you've seen it. Huh? Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler on the Roof. It's a, it's a play slash movie. It's been around uh, since a year before I was born. I believe it came out in 71 in the motion picture. And um, I enjoyed it quite often in my past. But if you're not familiar with the story, let me just explain this scene. So the movie opens with Reptilia talking about how the Jewish community in Russia kept their balance. And, they, and he says in, in there that he keeps his balance, or his people keep their balance, through tradition. And, and the whole song, there's a whole song that's really cool about tradition. But what's interesting is at a lull in the song where he's just talking, he says they have a tradition for everything. And in fact, uh, they have a tradition of how they keep their hair, head covered and what they wear. And then he says, now, you, you may ask, where do these traditions come from? And he says, I'll tell you. And then he pauses and he goes, I don't know. And so uh, that is the case with a lot of traditions, isn't it? A tradition comes from somewhere and we're really not sure why. You know, uh, it gets lost in history, doesn't it? And I think that's the biggest trouble with tradition, is we can all argue where it came from, but in the, at the end of the day, it's still a tradition. So I'm going to show you a tradition that hopefully they didn't keep very long. So let, let's look at this story. Turn, turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. We'll start there. And we'll, we're going to move through Exodus here, a few chapters. But I wanted to point this out because it says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. What's that at the beginning of? The Ten Commandments. So here God is speaking to the children of Israel from the top of the mountain, and He speaks the Ten Commandments. In fact, almost the rest of the chapter is the Ten Commandments. He actually goes into some other things towards the end. But almost the whole chapter is the Ten Commandments. The cornerstone to all law that man has ever created. Because that's where we learn. We learn the idea of law from God. Whether we learned it from the actual stones or we learned it from nature that God created. Because there are laws in nature. Such as the law of gravity. Right? Now, if we go on to Exodus 20, verse 18, I want you to notice this is still the speaking of the Ten Commandments. But I want you to see the setting that this happened in. So Exodus 20, verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightning and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. So the Ten Commandments were spoken from the mountaintop. The mountain shook. This is uh, Mount Sinai. The mountain shook. There was lightning. There was smoke. This was a very big, um, I don't want to say production, but... It was something to see, okay? This wasn't like uh, somebody went, hey, by the way, right? These were really announced, okay? And the pe they were so announced that the people were afraid. People started to back away from the mountain. Verse 19, And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. 
They're so afraid of God speaking to them that they're afraid they're going to die. And so they say, Moses, you do it. You, you listen and we'll hear you. Is that true? What do we find in the, as the story goes on, we find that they don't do that, do they? We'll listen to you, Moses. And then, you go through Exodus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you probably believe this too, right? There's constantly uh, second-guessing Moses. Even though right here they said they'll listen to him. Just a side note. Let's go to verse 20. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your face, and you see him not. And I want you to notice, he says, And his fear may be before your face. Whose fear? His fear. Okay. Keep that in your head for, for a minute. Because we're going to come back to that. That his fear may be before your face, that you sin not. Now look at this word, the word fear here. It's pretty interesting. It's from the Hebrew, of course. Uh, Yerah. And it says, look there, it says, morally reverence. So it's not just uh, being afraid. It's being, it's like a, a, a moral, awestruck. yeah, awestruck, reverence, uh, and respect for God. But I want you to notice, close, okay. <laughs> so I want you to notice that, that uh, this is being said to the people of Israel. And it's not fear, just anything, it's God's fear. Okay, that's important. Let's go to verse 21. And all the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. So the people are still standing back, and Moses walks on up to, to, the, uh, to, to where God was clothed in darkness, so to speak. Yeah, clouds and thunder all around. Now in the course of this conversation that God has with Moses, and there's a few things that happen back and forth in here, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move along. But I want you to notice Exodus 31, verse 17. Now, in this few texts before this, he's talking about one particular camp commandment. Which one do you think it is? Number four, yes, the Sabbath commandment. But I really liked, I wanted to just kind of emphasize verse 17. Because he's talking about the Sabbath, and he says, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel, how long? Forever. forever. Not today, not till something happens, but forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So we're told right there the Sabbath is a sign between God and his people. Well, that's pretty important. It sounds important to me. Now look at verse 18. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tablets of testimony, tablets of stone, written with what? The finger of God. There's three places in the Bible where God himself writes. This is one of them. He also writes in plaster. Remember? At the party that uh, Belshazzar was in control? Yeah, that's what he wrote. You're right. And then he wrote a third time. Did anybody guess? In the dust. That's right. So God wrote in stone, then he wrote in plaster, and then he wrote in dust. And the cool thing is the ones he wrote in dust, that was a, a list of sins. A lot of people believe that, and I agree. That Jesus wrote the list of sins of those people who were accusing the woman. And what did he write him in? He wrote them in dust. How easy is it to erase dust? Go away. Yeah. So he did, it's almost like he was saying, these are your sins, but I can blow them out. I can erase them. It's kind of cool. But this, the law is written in what? Stone. Can you blow stone away? Uh, not with a little puff of air, you won't. Right? So he is telling us all kinds of things in this story about how the law of God. You know, if you really want something to stick around, 
You, you write it on stone. You ever notice that? Uh, for instance, how many of you have burned information on a CD or a DVD from your computer? Well, you think, oh, that's, that's good, it'll be there forever. Actually, even those CDs and DVDs after a while will break down. But that's not permanent either. But think about the stuff that's written on stones, uh, the Rosetta Stone, for instance. Still around, thousands of years later. Ten Commandments, if we knew where the ark was, we'd open it up, and I guarantee you those words would be fresh as the day they were written. They have not changed, and they have not worn away. Let's go on. Verse 30, uh, chapter 32, verse 1. And when, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up! This kind of sounds rude, doesn't it? Yeah. Up! Lord, get up! Man. Make us gods which shall go before us. For as far as this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, was it Moses that brought us out of the land of Egypt? So their, their, their whole perspective is wrong. And we'll, we'll find that that God says, oh, that's what you think? And he echoes what they say here. We'll, we'll get to that. The man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. We don't know what happened to him. He's been gone for 40 days. We have no clue. So Aaron, get up and make us gods. Look at the next verse. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the gold earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them unto me. When I was a teenager, I wanted to get an earring, and this is one of the texts that I... Bad, bad news. Bad news to get an earring. I'm kidding. You shouldn't get it. But anyway, so he says, get the earrings. I, this is probably a good place to remember that Israel had been entrenched in Egypt for how long? 400 years. Yeah, like 400 something years, right? 400 what? 30. 30? 90? Yeah, I feel like a yeah, auctioneer there for a second. Anyway, 400 something years, right? They were entrenched in, in Egypt. Do you think that their, the culture of Egypt had any impact on them? Yeah. Definitely, right? I mean, you can't really be in a culture without. I mean, can you be in America without starting to kind of have an American point of view? You've been here for a while. Do you feel like you've been changed any by being in America from when you were in Denmark? No? Okay, your opinion doesn't count. All right, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, so let's go on to our next verse. No, you know. But, so, but I just want you to think about that. There, the culture of Egypt has already put an imprint on their minds. Okay? They're thinking like Egyptians in some ways. And, and we have to also remember that there was a mixed multitude with them. There were a lot of Egyptians that left with Israel. Uh, they might have been slaves in Egypt. They might have actually been Egyptians. But they did leave with the Israelites. And the Bible calls them the mixed multitude. So let's go on to the next verse. Verse 3. And all the people broke, break off the gold earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. So they did what Aaron said. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graven tool, and you can see the picture he's got a hammer, uh, and he made it a molten calf, and they say, now who said this? They say, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Now I want you to notice something. How many calves did he make? He only made one, right? This is a good spot to understand when they say gods in some places, they're only speaking of one. Okay? Uh, there are places in the Bible where it says God, but they, they're using the plural term Elohim, which means more than one. So clearly here, and this is it, maybe this is my opinion, I'm not a scholar, but to me this should say, this be thy God. And the reason I, and I've come to a point with that, but there's only one calf there. So it's almost like the people are saying, this is the God that we worship. 
They're not going after a bunch of gods. Just one. Okay? Alright. So let's go on to the next verse. Oh, oh. So look at this picture here. Now this is out of Egypt. What is that? It's a bull, right? What's it? You notice the thing on its horns? Yeah, look at that. There's another depiction of a bull from Egypt, and it's got some kind of thing in its horns. Uh huh. One more. This one's nice and big, so we can see it. And look, right there. There's a sun disc between his horns. So they made this bull, or this calf, only one, and it probably had Egyptian features because they came from Egypt. So we can almost assume it had sun disc. Now, what do you think they're venerating if the sun is in that bull's horns? Yeah. Something to do with worshiping the sun, right? So this bull somehow carries the sun in his horns. It's all connected. That's, that's what's really um, interesting. I don't know if interesting is the right word. But about the, the scripture, when you read through it, you go, wow, this is all connected. All right, let's go on. Verse 5. And when Aaron saw it, saw what? I don't think so. I think what he said, what it's saying here is Aaron saw that they said, this is our God. And he goes, oh. I don't know. I don't know for sure. But he says, it says, and when, Sarah, when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. So, okay, it's the camp. And Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow is the feast to our Lord's Lord. Okay? What I'm trying to get at is they're not worshiping other gods. They're trying to worship the one God. Are they doing it the right way? See, this isn't an argument. A lot of people make this an argument that they made a different God. That's not what's going on here. They made an idol of the one God. Can we do that? No. They're building a tradition here. They're saying, yeah, hey, uh, we're worshiping God. We're just worshiping God this way. See what I'm getting? If we worship God in any other way besides the way He dictates, are we really worshiping God? No. No. Okay. So it's important, I think, to remember that they weren't replacing God as far as, you know, a different person altogether. But they were worshiping Him in the wrong way. And the Lord said unto Moses, get, uh, Go, get thee down. Now listen to this. For thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt. Wait a minute. He's changed the way he's speaking here. You notice that? For thy people, not, not my people, thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. So now God says, hey, they want to say you took them out? All right. Go down and see them. They're messing up. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Verse 10, Now therefore let me alone. He's like, move aside, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that, that, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. I am wiping the slate clean. You know what, Moses? Never mind. Step aside. I'm fixing to burn them all up, and start over with you. That, that's pretty bad. So they did, so again, even though they're worshiping the true God, when they did it with a golden calf and with noisy, ruckus celebs, uh, celebrations, God was displeased. We can't worship God in the way we think is right. We can't worship God with our traditions. Am I making sense? Okay. Let's go on. Verse 11. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why did thy wrath wax hot against thy people which thou hast brought 
out of the land of Egypt with great power, with great hand. Moses says, no, 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 no. You brought them out. I did. It's interesting that Moses is saying, I know they said that, but I know you did. He's saying, God, I still believe in you. That's what he's saying here. God, I still believe in you. It's not that God forgot who brought him out. He's just echoing what the, what the children of Israel said. All right, let's go on down to the next verse. Wherefore, should the Egyptians speak and say, what for mischief did he bring them out and slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Well, that sounds kind of familiar. It's like he's speaking for Israel here. Like he's, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Interceding. Interceding. That's the word I was looking for. It's like he's interceding for Israel. Next verse. Remember, now look here, he's bringing, God doesn't forget. But sometimes God wants us to remind him. I know that sounds weird. That, that's what we do in prayer, isn't it? That this is what we should do in prayer. We should remind God, not that he forgets, but we need to remember. And so we hear Moses remind God, hey, what about Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou sweareth by thine own self? Who did he swear by? Did he swear by somebody else? You know, you ever heard of swearing by God? Well, if God does that, he has to do it by himself, right? There's no other God. So he swears by himself. Swear by thy own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. So Moses said, I know you're mad, but please don't do this. What's beautiful about this is this is a picture of Jesus, isn't it? He's interceding. This is a picture of Christ interceding for sinners. This is what he does for us when we mess up. As he says, whoa. Now, does the Father really need that? Does the Father love us? Does he get so angry? That... Yes, he loves us. But they work together. And it's for our sakes that all this happens. Now look at, let's move down to, I think we're moving down. Uh... No, we're still going, okay. Verse 14 and 15. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So Moses interceded like Christ intercedes for us. And the Father said, okay, I'm not going to destroy him. Okay? And Moses turned and went down from the mountain. And the two tablets of the testimony were in his hands. The tablets were written on both sides, both their sides. And on the other side... Okay. On the one side and on the other side were they written. And the tablets were what? The work. the work of God. Not just the writing, but the tablets. You know, sometimes you, you see these pictures where uh, or, or you get this idea that Moses chiseled the tablets out and handed them to God and he kind of jotted it down. No. The whole work. These tablets. Have you ever seen the pictures where they're all like, you know, broken and like lopsided, no, these were perfectly cut. I could, we can't tell you exactly what shape they were in or whatever, but we can say this: I bet they were perfectly cut. If we got, if we went and bare, you know, like dug up the ark somehow and we opened it up and we looked at these tablets, we go, "What were these cut with? These weren't cut with, you know, the Egyptians. They weren't like that. These are smooth and perfectly cut." So, here they are. And these tablets were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tablets. So who wrote it again? God wrote it. All right. Verse 17 and 18. And when Joshua, now let's notice this. And when Joshua heard the noise, now, this guy, we got to understand, Joshua kind of went up the mountain with him a little bit and then stopped. And he was kind of waiting. So you imagine 40 days, Joshua was sitting around going, he didn't go back down and he didn't go all the way up. He just sat and waited. That took faith. You think about it. You said uh, Moses is what, 100 and some years? No, no. He, he's like 80 some years old, right? Maybe almost into his 90s by this time. 
No. But he's 80 something years old. We know he lived to 120. And we know there's 40 years in Egypt, 40 years as a shepherd, and 40 years uh, leading Israel. So he's about 80 years old. You'd imagine Joshua would sit there and go, man, I, I hope he didn't die up there. Right? But Joshua doesn't do that because Joshua knows that God's still up there. And can God keep somebody alive no matter how old they are? <laughs> yeah. So, there you go. But listen, and when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. They're making so much racket down there. They were fighting. Yeah, that Joshua thinks they're fighting. They're, oh my goodness, somebody's attacking our people. Now, does that say something about worship and how it should be? Should, should we ever come into a church and it sound like there's a battle going on? The, the, the evidence says no, right? We already know they were worshiping the wrong way. So if we connect all that together, all that loud noise and banging around and jumping, and, and one text even says that they were naked. God says they were naked. So uh, is that the right kind of worship? Have you ever been to a church that got noisy like that? And he said, now this is... Uh, this is Moses' response. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for, be, for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. Oh my goodness. That must have been some raunchy, rowdy, noisy music. If, if, if Joshua thought that they were fighting, then Moses is not there singing. This was like a hard rock concert or something, don't you think? If we're going to follow the right pattern, would, it be, would that be the one we want to follow? I don't think so. Verse 19, And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf, Moses sees the calf, and the dancing, they were getting, they were getting busy, and jumping around, and doing all kinds of junk. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hand and break them beneath the mountain. He took those tablets made by God and he just smashed them in front of everybody. What's interesting is the person who interceded for the children of Israel is now angry. And guess what? He punishes. He punishes Israel. I don't know if you remember the story, but doesn't, don't they say every man get his sword? And they go through and kill. Right. Right. <clears throat> Even though Aaron was of the tribe of Levi. Yeah, the tribe of Levi actually got on their swords and they went through the camp of Israel and they killed a bunch of people. So, God wanted to destroy them all. Moses only killed some. And I'd like to think that he killed the ones that were most responsible. I don't know. It doesn't say. But a bunch of people died. So even though, remember Moses is kind of standing in the place of Christ. Even though Christ interceded, that didn't get rid of the punishment, did it? For those who did not repent, I guess I should say. Now look at James 10, 2.10, if you want to turn to the can, but it's right here. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all of it. It's just like when Moses had those commandments up, and he threw them back. <coughs> Did the commandment of, of idolatry like break off, but the rest of it was all intact? No, the whole thing smashed. It's one piece. We can't break off the ones we like and keep those and ignore the ones we don't like. Even if our traditions tell us to. 
So let's go to Mark 7, 5, where, where the scripture text started out. I want to look at that and then we'll close. Mark 7, 5. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the traditions of the elders? The what? The traditions of the elders. But eat bread with unwashed hands. There's nothing wrong with washing your hands, is there? Is there anything wrong with washing your hands? If you keep a tradition of washing your hands, is God going to be angry with you? No. In fact, we're actually commanded to wash. So that's not the problem here. Let's go on. Whoa. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Well hath Esaias prophesied of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, their heart was far from me. So check this out. Going on. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Remember how we talked about fear, the fear of the Lord? He, his fear is on you and then you won't see him? Okay. Keep that in your mind. In vain do they worship me. Were the children of Israel with their calf and their loud music, were, were they worshiping in vain? They were, right? There was no point in it. It was empty. Because it was not how God wanted to be worshipped. We can make statues of God. i got pictures right here of God. But if I'm using those to bow down and worship and say, that, hey, look, there's your God. No. That's where they messed up, right? Okay. Let's go on. Wherefore the Lord said, that, now what's interesting is Jesus quoted, that right there was a quote out of Isaiah. So I said, hey, let's look at it. Let's look at what Isaiah said. It says, wherefore, said, wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precept of men. Remember, God was going to teach them he, His fear, His law. Here we're seeing Isaiah saying they're teaching man's precepts. What are precepts? Laws, rules, right? Huh? Ideas. Ideas. Good. So that's what the, the whole battle is here. Are we going to teach the fear of God by His commandments, or are we going to teach the fear of God by man's traditions? For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold tradition of you hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. So they actually are setting aside the commandments of God. Can you imagine? Could you imagine having the Ark of the Covenant, opening it up, pulling the Ten Commandments out and going, eh, toss those aside and put your own writings in there. That's what they're saying. That's what Jesus is saying. They lay aside the commandments of God so that they can hold their own tradition. And he said unto them, full well you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your own tradition. And that was our text. If my people, look, I want to close with this. Just think about it now. I haven't come out and said it, but we've talked about the difference between the first day of the week and the seventh. And in our conversation, me and Keith, our conversation, he, he sent me in an email, a, a little thing, and it explained why Christians changed the day. Did you catch that? It said that in the text, Christians change the day. Israel built a golden calf. The Pharisees made all these rules that say you have to do this and that and that. Can we change? Do we have the right to change the laws of God? 
So this is, this is my plea, not to you guys, but to everyone who will see this at some point. This is my plea right here. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, it's calling to all of us, right? If my people, which are called by my name, or who are called by God's name, this is Christ. When you're called a Christian, is that that's sort of being by call? That's sort of being called by God's name, isn't it? Right? So, hey, Christian out there. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, don't privately cling to your traditions. Get rid of them. They're worthless. Remember, in vain they worship me. If they shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. We can all hear that. Then will I hear them. Wait a minute. Then you'll hear him. Is he not hearing our prayers if we're not in the right stance? If we're not humbling ourselves and casting away and repenting? Can he hear us? Did God hear the prayers that were sung and spoken around that golden calf? He saw the man. He watched that There you go. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, and will he heal. Did you catch that? And will heal their land. How will our, our land be healed? I mean, look at our land. Oh my goodness! Every time I turn around, I'm seeing a, a video where some uh, a police officer beat down somebody, or somebody beat down a police officer. People are burning their own uh, towns. They're killing their own kids. They're stealing from their own parents. Loved ones are stealing from their, their significant other. The, what about the environment? Oil, smoke, smog, tornadoes, earthquakes, fires. Does our land need healing? There's only one way our land's ever going to get healed. And it's not anything we can do. But if we will <clears throat> humble ourselves and pray and seek the face of God and turn from our wicked ways, He's going to hear. And, he, and then He'll heal our land. And how will He do that? By the return of Christ. Because when Christ comes, the land will be healed. Am I right? Can I hear an amen? Amen. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, let us, let us be on fire for you. Help us to step forward and be that, that, that mass of witnesses that change uh, the, or, or not change, but put out your words to our fellow Christians. Help us to show them that they need to change. They need to get rid of their traditions. And they need to take up the law of God, that beautiful law that you wrote. No man, but you wrote. And Lord, we're not perfect either. I know that for sure. Help our hearts to turn towards you as well. To get rid of the other sins. To honor the Sabbath the way we should. To cast away those sins that so easily beset us. <laughs> Help us to come to you, Lord. Humble. Teaching as we go. Your precepts. And not ours. Thank you, Lord, so much. For being merciful. Slow to wrath. And for sending your Son be that person who stands between us, who protects us, who intercedes on our behalf. I thank you, Lord, for all these many blessings, so dear and true to us. In the name of the beloved Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.